Hi uh, YouTube, this is Patrick, and this is my review for Game of Thrones Season 2 premiere of The North Remembers. Uh, I didn't do reviews of the show last year just because I wasn't putting stuff like that on YouTube at, the, at that particular point. Um, but I've been looking forward to doing this show because I've done a couple other shows. Um, and finally I can get to one that's actually, you know, good most of the time. Uh, not most of the time, good pretty much all the time. Unlike some of the other ones that I've been doing, like uh, Walking Dead and Dexter and stuff like that. Um, I read all the books uh, for this series, Song of Ice and Fire. Um, I heard about the show that HBO picked it up, and I saw some clips of it about, I don't know, about a few, maybe about eight months before it came on the air. So I picked up the books, read all of them, saw the first season. I put a little video on here about the first season's uh, Blu ray. Uh, but I figured, you know, I've been doing reviews for other stuff, so I might as well do Game of Thrones. Um, Pretty much my favorite show on TV right now, except for Breaking Bad. Um, but, uh, I'll get to Breaking Bad when I can, but, um, yeah, so anyway. Uh, I'm gonna split this review in half, where I'll do spoiler stuff as far as the book goes in this, you know, toward the end. I'll say when I'm gonna start doing that. Um, in this case, if no one wants to be spoiled, you know, uh, you'll be able to shut this off. Uh, as far as comments go, comments go, I'm not gonna sh keep shut comments off because uh, I just don't want to. Uh, but if you don't want to be spoiled, I suggest don't even look at the comments. Uh, if you want to talk to me about something, probably better to send me a message than um, than uh, than put it in the comments if you don't want to be spoiled. But uh, all right. So anyway, um, this was uh, this is a really solid episode. Um, it wasn't, you know, as it wasn't as great as uh, the show could possibly, you know, be. It wasn't like, you know, a ten out of ten for this show. But uh, that's because they basically had to set up everything for the whole season. So it was a big, like, you know, ground laying episode, pretty much. Um, and as far as that goes, they did a just a brilliant job. Uh, we went to I'm trying to think how many different locations we went to. Uh, it was King's Landing, Beyond the Wall, the Riverlands. The King's Road, across the sea, um, you know, so all these places, um, and, uh, Winterfell, and just, th if the show has, like, one fault, uh, with the episode last night, if the episode had one fault, is that e because everyone was in it, everyone didn't get as much, uh, as you would like, but, as I said before, this show is smarter than other shows where it will know that it'll leave characters out for a couple of weeks, and so others can get, you know, their their point of screen time. Um, some shows really need to, to learn how to do that. <clears throat> True Blood. Anyway, um, so yeah, I'll just I guess I'll just go in order with stuff. At, at King's Landing, uh, they they uh, we started Joffrey's name day, and uh, I gotta say Jack Gleason, uh, you know, gun to my head. Everyone loves Peter Dinklage, but Jack Gleason I think is probably the best actor on this show. Um, he, everyone, I just, I hate him, I hate him so much that I actually, like, I love him, I just, I love that he's, like, so good, and just such a little shit, it's, it's awesome, um, just this, he, it set the tone perfectly to start the show like that, to put it back in the world, and, um, you know, give us something, you know, that we knew we were gonna get, you know, getting pissed off at Joffrey, gave it to us right away, um, and having Tyrion show up and, you know, brighten the mood, um, putting violence right in our face with the, the body falling down and getting dragged away. Um, getting into the, uh, you know, the politics again. Putting the, uh, the, the, the white raven in the cage to signal that summer's over, it's autumn now. It's not winter yet, it's autumn, by the way. That didn't mean it was winter, it meant it was autumn. Um, so it was a great opening because it basically just slowly got us back into everything. They didn't introduce us to the new characters until about halfway through the episode. Maybe a little even more, I'm not sure. But, um... And basically, the episode pretty much from there started the whole trend that the episode was pretty much about power. And the writers of the show really basically say that the show is about power. And, uh... We saw all these kings or rulers or lords talking about power and how to rule over people. That was the theme, at least, of this episode. Um, so that came across great. And you got to give it to the writers that they were able to bring, you know, basically let us say hello to all our, you know, everyone from last season. Um, 
get them set up for their plot line this season, get them some good character stuff for, you know, for whatever screen time they had, introduce us to new people. So they did all this stuff in one episode while having its own singular, like, theme for an hour. That's pretty strong stuff. That's good writing. Um, and David Benioff and Dan Weiss, really, they just, the series is, is in such good hands with both of them. Um, but yeah, it's nice that, uh, just to get back to it, Cersei is a little more sympathetic now, almost by default, because she's basically being salted left right by, if not Tyrion, Baelish, and basically everyone knows that the secret's out, that, um, about her and Jaime. Uh, they're obviously not saying it's it's true in King's Landing just because things like what was going to happen to Littlefinger would happen. Um, which, uh, that was her one, you know, more strong moment in the episode. But she quickly gets shut down later because she was talking to Joffrey, she slaps him, and then he just completely puts her down. So she's kind of looking at him like, my god, what have I done? Um, but, uh, yeah, so... They've almost, by default, because of how bad Joffrey is, Cersei is becoming a little more sympathetic. Um, and her scenes with uh, Lena Headey is also, I think, she was somebody the first season I wasn't, like, I liked her, and she grew on me. I think she's clearly grown into the role a little bit more. And um, she was fantastic. Um, Dinklage, of course, is great. His scene with uh, Shay was less annoying than I thought it would be. Um... Not that I dislike her, it's just, um, you know, it was just, just wittier and more fun than I thought it would be. It was nice, like, light-hearted stuff, which the show needs sometimes. Um, but anyway, before I get to the end of the episode of King's Land, we'll move around. Um, first, I guess I'll just go with Danny, who's uh, stuck in a shithole in the desert uh, with her fantastic-looking CGI dragons. Uh, and, you know, they lingered on them, too, to really give us a good look of them. They didn't try to cheat. Uh, which they did try to do with the wolf later on, which I'll get to, but, um... There's even a shot of the dragons, like, the other one of the other dragons, like, Tail, was in the cage. Um, so really impressive. She, they really didn't give her much to do, uh, which, you know, basically just let her, let us know what's going on with her, and that's it. Um, you know, she gave, uh, Jorah a nice little compliment, which, um, you know, is kind of following up on his feelings toward the, the end of the first season. Um, but that was really it, uh, and that was, yeah, it's fine. Uh, at the wall, or north of the wall, they go to Craster's Keep. Um, also some witty dialogue. Uh, Jon Snow's blamed again for being too pretty. Um, and, uh, yeah, again, not much there. One of my favorite characters, Dolores Ed, who was the guy that talked, who said, um, uh... You know, this place. This looks like a place where I was born, and I've fallen on harder times, or then I fell on hard times. Uh, he's a great character, um, but yeah, it was just again a nice, just different, um, just a nice little quick like segment to let us know where John is and what's going on. Uh, to bring and talk about Mance Raider, and that there's like another king and another army. F you know, you know. F there's another force somewhere. That was the kind of the other theme, that there's all these forces that are all gathering, and you know eventually everything's just gonna, you know, just come crashing down. And it will. But, um... Yeah, but anyway. Uh, Bran's at Winterfell. Uh, Bran, younger than Joffrey, is already a better uh, ruler, because he has Ma Maester Lewin to help. Um, and Bran was also having wolf dreams, which is nice to see. Um, really sad... When uh, they put him on the ground, he had to crawl over to the uh, the lake. It was a nice little touch to kind of remind us all that, yeah, this really sucks that this happened to this kid. Um, so I just thought that was like a little moment that I really, really thought was well done. Um, anything with the Starks is more emotional in the show than anything else. Um, even like the look like Sansa gave Tyrion when he said, I'm sorry for your loss. You know, she had to quickly like recover from it. Just all that stuff is really good. Um, speaking of the Starks, Rob and Catelyn... And, uh, at the Riverlands. First, uh, Rob's, ter you know, Rob's terms was well done. It was, you know, nice to see Rob in kind of like a kick-ass mode. Um, it was nice to have his little dialogue with Theon. Uh, and Theon's going off to the Iron Islands. Um, which should, dealt, should get us some pretty good stuff. Um, his scene with Catelyn. The two, the two of my favorite scenes of the episode were his scene with Catelyn and his scene with Jamie. 
Uh, the Catelyn scene, because again, it was really, it was nice, it was touching, it gave us like a good emotional center of the show. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just liked it. The Jamie scene, I thought that was the best scene of the episode. Um, yes, the wolf did look like it was obviously CGI, but it got the job done. And, uh, if that's how, you know, if that's, if that's the best they can do on those wolves, I'm perfectly alright with it. Um, but, uh, I thought that was a great scene. It was great that he turned away pretty much all of, uh, Jamie's, like, little quips and everything like that. So, uh, I loved it. I thought that was great. Um, let's see who else before I get to the end, besides the new characters, if I'm missing somebody. That's the one problem here. I don't know if I'm missing someone. I don't think I am. Um, alright, so I'll just go to Dragonstone, the new people. Stannis, Melisandre, and Davos. Um, just, you know, a good introduction. It, it, it was a little bit slower, because it was more expedition, because it was more introduction than the rest of the episode. The rest of the episode was more like, you know, hey, look, here's this person again, and, you know, this is what they're doing. This was, like, introduction. Um, and, uh, so it felt a little bit slower paced, but two strong scenes the main actors really, you know, solidified themselves, like, right away, they were, you know, um, the personalities were all there, with Davos and Stannis and Melisandre, and, uh, just, yeah, just really well done, uh, Stannis looks like he means business, um, loved his, uh, table, the, the map of, uh, Westeros, that was great, uh, let's see, let's see, also loved how, how, funny Stannis is by trying so hard not to be. Just, um, I'm glad they got that right. Uh, because that's how Stannis is. He's just so, just dead, deadly serious that he almost makes, like, insults and jokes without even knowing. And, uh, it's one of my favorite things about that character, and I'm glad I saw some of it. You know, he wasn't my beloved brother. I didn't love him, he didn't love me. You know, just well done. Um, and then the episode ends with something that was mentioned in the book but wasn't in it um, with the slaughter of Robert's bastards this was almost take it looked like it was almost like a biblical thing where it was like slaughter of uh, oh, what is it I don't remember the exact the exact story but it was like slaughtering like firstborn child or whatever but um, all the bastards you know guys carrying a dead baby like it's a, a dead like squirrel basically it's, you know cutting the one baby's throat from last season. It's just it was it was pretty brutal drowning kids. Um, it uh, you know when we go back and watch that scene from the first season when Ned's talking to the girl about the baby, you're gonna look at that scene completely differently now and just go, oh god, how awful is this gonna be? Um, you know you just think of how bad it is, and that's you know that's pretty strong stuff. And I will say that the writers and the director Alan Taylor, who directed the last two episodes of last season. Did a, just did visually a great job of connecting everyone using the comet. Um, I thought that was a great choice. That was just just really well done, and um, I mean the visuals were just like stunning. It was like watching a watching a movie um, from every location. Every it was just just beautifully done. Alan Taylor is directing three more episodes this year, and it's just uh, I'm really looking forward to. It. We're gonna lose him because he's doing Thor two, so he said he can only do one episode of season three. Which hasn't got the green light yet. It will probably in two days. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, I love Alan Taylor. So I'm looking forward to next week's episode. Uh, again, just specifically for him, pretty much. And, uh, yeah, so I guess... I guess that's going to be it for this part of the review before I get to the spoiler stuff. Just, you know, really, really good episode. Not surprised. Um lived up to its, you know, to its height, to its long delay, and you know, for a long time off and everything like that. Um, yeah, so I loved it. I look forward to the next nine. Uh, they're gonna fly by fast. Um, because they're gonna, I'm gonna, you're gonna be looking forward to it every week, and before you know it, it's gonna be over again. So I'm gonna, I can't wait to just sit back and enjoy it. And, um, yeah, so let me know what you thought before I get, now I'm gonna switch over to the spoiler, uh, section. Um, so if you don't know, want to know anything, shut it off right now. Uh, okay? Right now. Okay. This is the spoiler section for anyone that's read the books. Um, <coughs> I will just say right off the bat that th them not opening with the prologue surprised me. Um, for obvious reasons, I just expected them to do that. Um, 
but it was a, another great choice right off the bat. I loved right off the bat, like the writers are basically saying, this is our version of it, not just not you know George's. Um, you know, it's not going to be page for page, which we all knew going in. But I just saw that right away they changed it, um, almost to ease us into the fact that all these changes are coming. It was just right away. There we go. Um, and uh, it was nice just seeing Sansa save Dantos, thinking where that's all going to go. Um, I like that Sansa kind of smartened up fast, um, and her more... Th I like that, you know, she'll be sm a little bit wiser this season and much more sympathetic than last year. Um, I like Sansa from the books. I know she's even she's kind of polarizing for the book readers, but I, I, love, I love Sansa. I grew to love Sansa, pretty much. Um... I'm glad that Tyrion's scenes are just... I'm glad that Dinklage is first in the credits. This is really awesome, and he should be, especially for this season. Uh, this is pretty much his high point, so... You know, before everything comes crashing down. Uh, so I'm glad that's going to be front and center. Like I've said, Lena Headey's Cersei is now, like, officially, like, perfect for me. Um, and I like that they're jumping the gun on her sympathy you know, before we can get into her head in the fourth book when you see that she's really kind of nuts. Um, I like how that it's like a slow burn of crazy is pretty much coming on here. Um, and you can kind of understand why. The scene with uh, Baelish is something that I heard about uh, beforehand. And I heard people were upset about it. I actually thought it was really well done. And it even serves as good motivation for his character. I thought he kind of was, was going to attack her just for no reason. That was the impression I got that he was going to kind of spill the beans and say that he knew what was going on. But he didn't do it until she insulted him. And that's kind of really what his one weakness is, him getting insulted. He kind of can... He gets a little, you know, pissed off and he'll try to throw an insult back and he just did it to the wrong person. Um, and uh, and it will serve as motivation for him to do what he does when he goes to the Tyrells. And for the Purple Wedding and everything like that. So I thought that was really nice. Um, I don't know if it was Cersei that slaughtered the... I think Cersei gave the order in the books to slaughter the bastards, but I th it looks like they changed it to Joffrey for the show, which is fine. It's fine by me. I've heard people are pissed off, really like pissed off about that, that they're making Cersei too sympathetic. Well, I don't think we're going to have to worry about Cersei being too sympathetic. Um, we're going to give her plenty of shit. She's going to do plenty of awful things. She doesn't have to slaughter bastards for us to, you know, dislike her. It's already there. It's fine. In my opinion, anyway. Um, Danny. I'm glad we didn't spend much time with Danny because, to be honest, they really have to invent stuff this season for her. Uh, it's she her her chapters in the second book for me were kind of boring except for one, which is the House of the Undying chapter. Um, but they're gonna have to. I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing what they're gonna do with Korth and everything like that. But you know, uh, it's fine that she didn't get that much screen time because there's really not that much for her to do, at least at this point. Um, I'm glad we got that we skipped over going... They mentioned going to all the abandoned places when they before they got the Craster's uh, Keep up at the wall. I'm glad they skipped that. Um, and we went right to Craster's Keep, gave John something to do right away. You know, a new... Just, it, it was just well done. Uh, it was nice to see Jilly. That was Jilly that uh, the guy Craster grabbed her ass. Uh, yeah, so... Looks a little... I guess she's described that young in the books. I don't really know, but... She looked a little young. I heard she was on this show called Skins. I haven't I haven't seen it. Anyway. Um, the brand scene. I love the brand scene at, at Winterfell. You know, that's another thing that they're going to have to really be careful with not to be boring. Bran's probably going to miss a couple episodes early on until uh, Theon shows up later on this season. Um, which, again, nice groundwork on... Uh, wait, before I get to Theon. The Wolf Dreams, thank God. I'm glad they're in. Um... I really loved all that. That was that was really really good to see. Uh, pretty much how I expected them to look. Um, so that was nice. Uh, all right, then switching over to Rob and Catelyn. They're gonna give Rob more screen time this year, and it looks like Catelyn. I don't, Catelyn's not gonna get less. She's just <coughs> Rob's gonna be a little more front and center, which I think is is right. Um, especially considering what's going to happen. And that's why that scene was more emotional with Rob and Catelyn. Everyone knows with the, the Red Wedding and everything like that. So it's really well done. Him saying, you know, one day we'll all be together again. I'm just sitting there, you know, it's just like facepalm uh, city, basically. And it's just brutal. 
the same with Jamie. You know, Jamie spends the entire book, you know, off screen or off page, whatever you want to say. Uh, and so does Rob, pretty much mostly. And to just kill two birds with one stone, put both of them together, and showcase um, Grey Wind. It was a, it was a great choice. You know, it was the best scene in the episode, and it was not from the books. It was invented for the show, and it was brilliant. And I love that that they're using real wolves and CGI now, and it looks because it looks great. It looks great to me. I know people might be disappointed, but it looks great to me. Um, what else? Uh, moving to uh, the Dragonstone scenes. I was wrong about Carice Van Houten. Uh, I saw some clips of her as Melisandre, and I thought, eh, I don't know. She, I thought she was great. Uh, just really solid. I love Stephen Delane. And Liam Cunningham didn't have that much to do yet as Davos, but he was fine for now. I'm sure he's going to grow into it and be awesome. Um, I like what they did with... Um, Melisandre, like, basically, it was, saw that, you know, uh, Crescent was dying and she took a sip anyway. Um, one reviewer described it as her having, um, making a Princess Bride joke. Her, uh, building up a, um, was it, immunity to Iocane powder, or whatever. Um, but really, really good. Just really good. Um, what else am I missing? Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, I guess that's going to be it for now. Alright. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think they set up this whole season, and even further seasons, beautifully with this one episode. Uh, so really well done. Uh, the only down, like I said, the only downfall was that there were so many characters. I mean, we only saw Arya for a second at the end. So um, the downfall is when all the characters... I don't think we're going to have any more episodes this season where all the characters are in it except for the finale. I think that's going to be it. Like, someone's going to be left out next week completely. Maybe even multiple people. Um, which I'm fine with. You know, let's see them when they're doing something interesting. Let's not see them just, you know, to say hello every single week. Um, we had to say hello because it's the first episode, so that's fine. But, let you know, not do it every single week. Um, yeah. So that's it. Okay. I'll uh, see you guys next week then. Later.